What's going on everybody? Welcome back to my channel once again. So today we're going to be taking a look at the Creality Surmoon S1 3D Scanner. Now I've reviewed and tested out the Creality Otter in the past, but this one is their more industrial pro scanner. The Surmoon S1 offers the ability to scan both small and large objects ranging from 5 millimeters to 4,000 millimeters with accuracy detail up to 0.02 millimeters. It has multiple laser modes from single line blue laser for deep hole scanning, seven parallel lines for high detail, and 34 blue laser lines for quick scanning. It also features an infrared camera for capturing those scans without the need for markers, along with an RGB color camera for texture mapping. What made this stand out the most to me though is the quick scanning. With the 34 blue laser lines, I'm able to scan objects at up to 90 frames per second, which compared to other models completely blows it away. Typically, all other previous scanners I've tested out, the max frame rate is around 15 to 30 frames per second, so I'm excited to see how much faster this will actually scan. Now, this also has the ability to scan wirelessly using the scan bridge, but I currently don't have that, so I'll be testing that out in a future video. I am looking forward to that, though, as I've never been a huge fan of cords, as you're sort of limited to what you can scan. If you're trying to scan large objects, it makes it extremely hard to try and hold the computer while trying to scan. It also makes it hard if you need to have the computer plugged in, as the cord will only reach so far. With that being said though, let's jump right into this and first see how it comes packaged. Upon opening the box, it comes inside of a large hard plastic waterproof case to make sure nothing gets damaged. All the necessary cords were inside their own boxes and includes the calibration board along with plenty of markers to use for the blue light scanning. I do want to point out that in order to use the blue light mode, you need to use the markers, otherwise it just won't work. Only the infrared mode is currently capable of scanning without the markers. It comes with a long cord and all the connections you're going to need, depending on which type of power outlet you have. So here in the US, I'll be using the two prong connection, but if you're in another country, there'll be an adapter for you as well. To get it connected, all you need to do is slide the connector on and it will snap into place. It also comes with a USB-C adapter if you need to use that as well. It does come with a manual, although it's pretty basic and doesn't really explain everything in detail. Mainly the software, as if you've never used it before, it can be a little tricky on what everything does. Since I have used this software in the past, I'm already pretty familiar with it, so it shouldn't be that much of a problem for me. If you do need help though, feel free to leave a comment and I'll try my best to help you out. To get started though, all you need to do is connect the cord to the bottom of the scanner and tighten the thumb screw so it doesn't disconnect. Then you'll just need to attach the power supply cord and plug it into the computer. I do wish that it would just use power from the computer without the need for an additional plug, but oh well. I will get more into that though a little bit later. Then just make sure you download the software from Creality's website and you're all set. So once I had everything set up and downloaded, the first thing I wanted to do was check the performance based on my hardware setup and then make sure the scanner was calibrated properly. With the scanner connected, if you click the little gear icon at the top, you can run a performance test to see how well your scanner will perform. Now I initially had this set up on my older laptop and the performance was just okay. The max frame rate maxed out at about 40 frames per second instead of the 90, so I do recommend making sure your computer is powerful enough first. I then proceeded to run the calibration test. This was a simple process and I just needed to scan the QR code on the back of the calibration board and follow the instructions. You basically just need to face it in the center and move it up and down, side to side, and back and forth, depending on what the software wants you to do. The entire process only took about two minutes. It does seem a little tricky at first to try and get and angle it correctly, but once you get the hang of it, it does go much faster. It won't continue until you get the scanner in the right place, so you can take your time. Once the calibration was complete, it was time to try out my first scan. For the first scan, I wanted to try out the skull that I have. It has plenty of detail, and with the eyes and nose sunken in and dark, it seemed like a good starting point to test out all the blue laser light modes. So to get started on this, I first scan the global markers first. This isn't really necessary, but it does help speed up the process. Once the global markers were scanned, I switched to the point cloud and set the resolution to 0.2 millimeters and the laser mode to cross lines. This will use the 34 blue laser lines to scan it first. To start the scan, you can either hit the preview button in the software or hit the middle start button on the scanner. I am showing this in real time so you can see for yourself how quickly this actually scans. 
I tried to keep the scanner in place and rotate the turntable to scan all around the skull. On the left side, you can see where it's optimal, so I tried to keep the scanner in one place and just rotate the turntable. This first scan, I wanted to capture as much of the skull as possible. Some parts were hard to scan, but the beauty of it is, is you can just create multiple scans and merge them together later on if you need to. Once I felt I got enough of the scan, I hit the start stop button again to pause it. If you want to continue to scan more if you might have missed some spots, you can just hit the start button again to resume. But for this, I'll click on finish and start a new scan. Looking at the preview, I can tell that I missed a few parts, but overall it's looking pretty good and it only took a minute to get. So I'll start a new scan and rotate the skull on the side so I can capture the side a little better along with the bottom of it. I'll keep the rest of the settings the same and hit the start button again to start this new scan. Again, you can see just how fast this goes. Once I felt I got enough of it again, I just hit stop and finish to complete this scan. I did the same thing again and hit new scan. I rotated the skull on the other side and kept all the settings the same. I sped up this scan as I think you get the idea. Once it was finished, I hit finished once again and this time rotated the skull so it was facing upwards. This would allow me to scan the eyes and nose a little better. I switched the mode to single line as this helps to get into the deep spaces that normally would have trouble. I then hit start once again and started scanning. As you can see, it is much lower this way, but allows me to fully scan the eyes and nose. When the scan turns blue, you know you have captured it. I feel like this part took the longest out of all of it, but it is necessary if you do want a good scan. I will speed this part up again a little bit so I don't completely bore you to death. Now that I had all the scans, I can go in and remove all the pieces that I don't want like the base and any stray floaters. You'll need to keep at least six markers in there, otherwise you'll get an error from the software. I'll do this for each of the scans and then I'll be right back. Now I can highlight all the scans and click on Fusion to batch fuse them all at once. Depending on the resolution you set, this can take a little bit of time for it to run through each one. Once the Fusion was complete, I could go back in and remove all the rest of the pieces that I didn't want. Since a lot of it is overlapping, I wasn't too concerned if I cut a little off the bottom that was touching the base. Once everything was removed, I can go into mesh processing and click on align. This will orient them all the same way. I just let the software auto align them, but if it does do a bad job, you can also manually align them yourself by clicking on three similar points. Once that was finished, I then had a complete scan. There were a few little pieces that I forgot to remove, but I could easily go back into the scan and remove them. Just make sure you hit save afterwards, otherwise it will still be there if you click off that scan. Now that everything was aligned and all the floating pieces were removed, I just needed to mesh it all together. I clicked on meshing and left all the settings as they were. If you need to adjust them, you can, but I just left them all alone. Once the meshing was complete, I did notice a few little holes that I guess I forgot to scan. It's no big deal though, as I can just go into edit mode and fill those holes automatically. I now had a complete scan and I think it came out really good. I was able to capture all the detail including the eye sockets and nose and the whole process didn't take long at all. The longest part was probably just waiting for all the scans to process during the fusing. Depending on how good your computer is, this could go really fast or could take much longer. It also depends on what you set the resolution to. If you set it really low at 0.1, it will take significantly longer and might even fail if you don't have enough RAM to handle all the processing. Next up, I wanted to try something a little bit more complex, so I grabbed my Ryobi drill to try and scan that. Again, I scanned the global markers first before placing the drill on a turntable. If you want to save some time, you can save the global marker scan and then simply import it the next time you want to use it. This way, you don't have to keep scanning the markers over and over again each time you start a new scan. Once the global markers were scanned, I placed the drill on the turntable to start scanning. For this first scan, I started with the parallel lines to try and get the best possible detail and set the resolution to 0.2. This drill was a little trickier to scan, 
as it is oddly shaped, but so far so good. I will speed this up a little again so you don't have to sit through this entire process. Once the initial scan was done, I hit finish and turned the drill on the side. I switched the mode to the cross lines for this one to start. You can switch modes at any time during the scanning process by double clicking the start button on the scanner. Here you can see that I switched to the single line mode to try and capture the holes on the side. I continued this entire process starting new scans each time and rotating the drill in different directions to capture the entire thing. Once I felt I had everything captured, I just needed to fuse them and line them into software. Again, this process was pretty straightforward and it aligned them perfectly using the auto mode. I then just went into the edit to fill any holes that I might have missed. I did have to manually fill a couple of holes because the software missed a few on auto mode. Overall though, I think this came out great. I think it captured all the detail I was looking for and even the holes where the screws go. There were still a couple of holes that just didn't pick up, but for the most part, it got everything I wanted. I do think the surface could be a little bit smoother in certain areas, but I could easily clean that up afterwards if I wanted to. I did want to try the deep hole scanning a little bit more, so next up was to try this round piece of aluminum that I haven't melted yet. It has a nice big hole, so I figured it would be perfect to try and scan. I started with the parallel lines first to get the main outer shape, and then switched to the single line to try and capture the inner part. I didn't rotate this at all to capture the entire piece, as I just wanted to see how well this would capture the hole. After removing the base so I was just left with the cylinder, here is the end result. I think it came out okay. It did capture the entire center, however the inner walls were a little rough and didn't pick up all the ridges that were inside. It did pick up a few, but not all of them. I do want to point out though that I didn't edit this with mesh smoothing or fill any holes, so this is how it is after fusing the point cloud and removing the base. Lastly, I wanted to try out something that was much bigger along with the color mapping, so I figured I would try and scan my giant 3D printed life-size Jason Voorhees. I used the infrared camera for this scan and set the mode to body. Again, you can see just how fast this is scanning. I will speed this up again though, so you're not sitting through the entire process. Since this object is much bigger, I did have to pause it a few times to rotate Jason in order to get the back and sides. When I was nearing the end and trying to get more of his feet, the scanner did come unplugged from the wall and disconnected. Luckily though, if that happens, you can just plug it back in and continue where you left off. This actually happened a couple times and was by far the biggest struggle I encountered while using the scanner. Since I don't have the scan bridge yet, I was limited to the length of the cord. I was able to get it finished scanning though, and then just needed to clean it up. Since I only paused the scan to rotate Jason a few times, it's one big continuous scan, so there wasn't anything to align afterwards. And since I used the IR mode, I was able to capture the color detail as well. Once the meshing was done, I applied the color mapping, and this is how it turned out. It's definitely not the best color scan I've gotten out of any 3D scanner I've used, as you can see a lot of the shadows, but for the most part, it did a decent job considering the lighting and how big this is. You can see though all the seams from the different filament I used to print this. One of these days I'll fix it and paint the entire thing, I just don't have the time to do that right now. Looking at the mesh itself though, I think it did a really good job. I was even able to get the entire machete with him, and again, this was one continuous scan. So I did have my daughter try and scan me off camera, and as she's never used a 3D scanner before, I think she did a really good job. I had her just scan the front of me as I wanted to test out the face scan mode, and I think it worked really well. This was the first scan I've done of my face where my eyes are actually open, and it didn't look like a complete disaster there. Some areas aren't perfect, but for someone using it for the first time, I think it's great. Even the color mapping isn't that bad. There are some parts that are messed up, like the shirt, but I'm sure if we tried a few more times, we could get it much better. So now let's go over my thoughts on this. Overall, I think it's a fantastic scanner. The high speed scan rate alone makes this worth it. At 90 frames per second, this blows away every other scanner I've used in terms of speed. With its multiple laser modes, you really can't go wrong. 
It has the 34 blue laser lines for quick scanning, the parallel lines for the high detail scanning, and the single lines for when you need to get into the deep holes or pockets that you normally aren't able to scan. And with the IR mode, it's perfect for when you don't want to use the markers at all or you aren't able to. I really like that you can easily start, stop, or pause the scans directly on the scanner itself. It also has buttons to adjust the brightness or zoom in, although I really didn't use that at all as I mainly just kept it on auto mode. The color mapping probably would have came out a little bit better if I had made some slight adjustments using those settings. This isn't a very heavy scanner at all and is very easy to hold in your hand. I pretty much just held it in one direction with my finger over the start stop button the entire time. As for the software, it's fairly easy to use. However, there is one thing that I think needs to be added and that's moving around the 3D model space. Trying to rotate the model in a direction that you need isn't always the easiest. If they just had added a gizmo to easily pan and rotate around the object like in any other 3D modeling software, that would make things a whole lot simpler. But if somehow you can do that in the software already, I'm not sure how it works and it's not clear. I think the biggest downside to this by far is the cords. You have to have the scanner plugged in to not only the computer, but also to the wall. Because of that, it limits you even more on how far you can move. As I was scanning Jason, the power cord came unplugged numerous times and stopped the scan. The good news though, is that I was easily able to pick up where I left off without an issue. It would be nice if the scanner was able to utilize the computer power instead of having a separate cord or have an internal rechargeable battery built into the scanner itself. Now I will be trying out the scan bridge next though, so that should get rid of this issue. So I mentioned this before, but in order to use the scanner and get the most of it, you should have a pretty decent computer. If your computer is older, the scanner won't be able to perform as well as it should. I would recommend at least 34 gigs of RAM and preferably an i9 processor or above. Anything lower than that could cause the scanner to have a lower frame rate and could cause the meshing or fusing to fail from lack of memory. Also, the faster your computer is, the quicker the software will run when fusing. It can take some time to fuse all the points together, so if you set the resolution to something really low like 0.1 or have a very large scan of millions of points, expect to wait a pretty long time for it to process. I'd recommend starting at 0.2 and then make adjustments as needed. As far as the scan results go, I think they all came out really good. From small objects to much larger objects to more complex objects, each one I think turned out great. There were a few parts that I think could have been a little bit smoother, but overall I was happy with the results. And paired with the speed, I can't really complain at all. I'm sure the more I use this as well, the better the scans will get. So if you're looking for a scanner that is more for industrial purposes, reverse engineering, and you want that speed that comes with this, I would highly recommend checking this out. This is more expensive than many of the other scanners out there, but it's probably worth it depending on your situation. If you only need to scan small objects here and there, then maybe you might want to check out some of the less expensive scanners like the Otter or the Otter Lite. I will be testing out the scan bridge to go along with this, so stay tuned for that video. It is an accessory, so it doesn't come stock with the Surmoon S1, and you'll have to purchase that separately, but it will allow you to scan wirelessly. I will have links though down in the description on where you can pick up the scanner, and if you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment down below. Also, if you're wondering about the scanning turntable I was using, I did just find it online for free. It was a 3D model and I just printed it out. I didn't print out the full design as that included a base and you'd have to buy a bearing to go with it separately. So I just printed the bottom and the sides and placed it on top of a turntable that I already had, which was much smaller though. I then just added the markers randomly onto the surface. Well, that's going to be it for this video, everybody, and I hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button down below and ring the bell to get notified of all the new videos that come out. But thanks for watching, and I will see you all in the next one.